Hey guys, Grand Okage here from Critical Effect, and if you've been looking to learn how to rat, well I got a video for you. Today, we're going to learn a little bit about wormholes so that we can identify threats, develop security solutions, and then go and actually rat and make money. Uh, we're going to be focusing on C3 space, a very middle of the ground, great money making kind of system while still staying at entry level. Like a lot of new players can actually go and rat C3s, and a lot of veteran players can very efficiently rat C3s. Either way, Great way to make money all around, either through ratting, through gas huffing, through a little bit of mining if you're into that, I don't really do that, and then data relics. I got so lucky with the data sites we had today. So lucky. But nonetheless, let's get into it, with starting off with understanding Anoikis. You see, Anoikis exists outside of New Eden. It has no gate network, and all travel to and from systems within Anoikis are done via wormholes. Systems within Anoikis exist as one of six possible classes, ranging from C1 to C6, and these numbers basically mean how dangerous they are. Higher the number, higher the severity of the local effect if it has one, and higher the number means stronger the sites. The wormholes used to travel system to system in JSpace have several key attributes we need to consider, such as their size, life expectancy and time, and mass stability. Um, wormholes are not stable and by nature will collapse if too much mass passes through, or by old age. Wormholes can come in one of four sizes. These include 1 bill, 2 bill, 3 bill, and 3.3 bill. There's also a 5 bill. It's reserved just for a, a static high sec. We ignore those. They don't exist. Don't roll those. They, <laughs> you will hate yourself. Now, in ratting perspective, what we care about in wormhole systems is how to secure them. Understanding that a wormhole left open or unwatched connects to a web of possibilities that can just totally ruin our PvE goals. So, if you leave it unattended, eh, not good. Now, rolling, yes, rolling. The act of putting large amounts of mass through a wormhole so that it closes off. Now, imagine you had a power to permanently turn a stargate off. Like, that would make 1DQ the greatest possible riding area, right? That's literally J space. We, we turn off these wormhole connections by putting mass through them to roll them off. We become islands, little safe havens, and our worries come from other things. So, at this point, I'm gonna go into how wormhole mechanics actually work. I won't be offended if you skip ahead, guys. Uh, wormholes, they, they're directional. They, there's a front and there's an end. A K162 is the end. The front is the name side. So when you see like a U210, when you see a C247, when you see a N110, when you see all these different named fronts, that's the front. Uh, we care about this for later. When a new SIG spawns and we scan it down and we go to it, and we see because it's a new SIG, therefore it's a, either a wandering hole or it's a K162. We care about the difference. Um, a wandering hole is safe to rat with. Matter of fact, you have like two hours after you warp to it to just leave it there and not worry about it spawning the other side. It's just still a dead end. Wandering hole safe. K162 means you just got rolled into. Someone just activated that. Player activity has directly involved themselves now freshly into your system. You should stop ratting. <laughs> K162 is very dangerous. Uh, a K162 could be from just a random explorer, just pushing chains out, looking and being peaceful. Who knows? Or it could be a group rage rolling their static hole, looking for people ratting which is something people do. <laughs> it's a very real thing. Either way, we need to make sure that whenever we get a new SIG, while we're riding, we're always scanning it to verify that it's safe. So I hope I painted to you an image of Anoikis, a web of entangled systems connected by temporary wormholes that build ever-changing dynamic connections of systems. Our goal is to tame the systems be more favorable to our PVE conditions we want. We can look at like what a day tripper might see. A day tripper comes from high sec, so their anchor, their central point in the world is where they came from, because they probably want to go home at the end of the day. Their view of their system then goes from there. And it might be only so extensive or so accurate, depending on how thorough their scanner is. Securing a hole that they want to rat would then look like this you still have the high sec they came from if they want to preserve their way out they could roll the high sec off too and just become this little c3 island and then find a different way out later 
because this C3 island has a high sec static. So when I roll that Ulsa connect, a new high sec will spawn. But typically, uh, day trippers, they suffer from the inability to just have a bunch of tools at their hand. We have rollers, we have scouts, we have combat ships, we have PVE ships, we have everything we need as wormholers just in our hub ready and waiting. Day trippers don't have that, they gotta travel. Now, wormholes, on the other hand, might have a chain that looks like this on any day. It's pretty extensive, it's regulated. We as wormholer groups, we probably manage and require our scanners to reach a certain minimum of criteria, such as if you're going to scan a system, you got to scan it all the way down. I don't want to go to E12 on this map and then find out there's actually six other wormholes off of it, you know. Like that's just ignorance <laughs> you know we're very thorough we're very expansive but nonetheless if we decided we wanted to wrap we would then have to shut our systems down if we wanted to use our c3 static our hub would then look like this all the connections gone either from our hub where we live to the system we want to rat in and the great thing with this though is that it's a static so when we're done ratting in this c3 when we fully liquidated everything it has we just got to roll the connection and we get a new one <laughs> and we don't have to go anywhere <laughs> wormhole life now when explaining the world we are ratting in i leaned on our first tool for being safe in wormhole space and that is rolling off unwanted connections and anything that you're not using is unwanted so roll them off because that's just an entrance for someone to come into who knows who's five jumps down that path the whole world's five jumps down that path roll it off get it away you don't need that thing to be open it doesn't need to exist that's one less liability you have to worry about now for day trippers the gameplay is different you don't have a multitude of ships handy to roll holes scout rat respond to vpv situations so adjust your gold standard and the first thing you can do is decide you know what i'm not going to roll that hole i'm going to leave an alt there with eyes on it who's going to listen for jump activations that's called soft power it's soft because if that jump activation is a scout for a very large group you can bet there's a fleet inbound in about a minute now this soft power is basically an alarm network when you put eyes on things and honestly if you have the manpower to do it the spare tunes the amount of counts the ability to do it yeah that just saves you 20 minutes of rolling holes and maybe there's something down the chain that way that you want to keep so this allows you to preserve chain now either way i roll the holes off or me and my friends put eyes on the holes not doing one or the other means you're operating completely in the blind which is fine i get it i've been there i do it sometimes too you know you're just solo you can't really put things everywhere you don't want to have to roll it's fine just know that these are the security measures a lot of other people are taking when i say i haven't been ganked and 10 weeks well wh what did you do to be safe you just went into an open hole with 13 connections like what i would never rat in a system like that no be picky and then if a system isn't up to your standards see if you can make it up to your standards and then while you're rolling those holes if you get ganked boom <laughs> it wasn't a safe system all right so step one done set up hole control there by rolling holes or putting eyes on things and preferably by eyes i mean bubblers bubblers are better now what we're established we're secure we're ratting what's our next fear how do we get around it well the k162 that we mentioned earlier when someone rolls into us so they have a static they rolled their static it now spawns a new static they send a scout to the static the second the scout jumps the wormhole we will see the new sig spawn on our side when you see that spawn, you need to start spamming your D-Scan for a minute because they're, they have a, they can hold cloak for up to a minute. So just keep spamming for about two minutes probably, to be honest, and see if you see a scout. If you see a scout, you 100% just got K162. If you don't see a scout, you still got to verify it's safe. You need to get a scout of your own to scan down the new SIG and see what it is. It will either be a wormhole or a normal site. If it's a wormhole, you gotta go verify if it's a Wandering or a K162. As we mentioned earlier, Wanderings are safe. We're the fresh side. It's not spawned yet. That won't, yeah, it spawned for us, but it hasn't spawned for the K162. 
and when you warp to it, you start a timer. You don't actually spawn the next side, unless you jump it. If you jumped it, you 100% spawn to the other side. Um, so just leave it if it's a wandering. But again, those K162s, you, you don't know what they are. And maybe it's just a scout going by, maybe not. Up to you. I typically stop ratting when I get K162'd and I go and roll it. So how do we detect K162s? Well, we keep our probe scanner on our window at all times. If you have everything scanned out, then a new SIG will be blatantly the only red SIG. So that's one way. Or you can control A to select all, and then it will then highlight all the SIGs that are currently there. Any new SIG will spawn as unhighlighted. And with all that, what is the last thing that can really help us in wormhole space? And you probably already know about it, but I'll preach on it. And that's V. Yes, V. Your shortcut D scan. You gotta smash that thing. You gotta teach it who's boss. I don't do it enough. Please, just descan. <laughs> There's so many times we get really juicy minor kills and we're on descan for like 20 seconds, really slow. And when we land, they're not even moving because they're not descanning. They're not looking around. They're, they, they didn't see us. If you click V and descan, you will see what's around you. That's the only way you're really gonna see if a local logs in, if there's a Kovops that was cloaked the whole time who was floating around, any random stuff, that's the only way you will ever see it, and that is descanning. So be better than me, descan. <laughs> so, coming up on a year ago, I made an intro to ratting video and showed people new to Eve how to rat in C2 space. Uh, the reality is, not many people rat in C2 space. Like, maybe people new to wormholes who see the stats and want that easier level, but the reality is, C3 space and C5 space are where people rat at, and that's because they're good money makers. Now, a rare select rat in C6 space, which is limited by access and a lot of political wormhole red tape, an even rarer group actually rat C4 space, and I assume it's because they enjoy the challenge, but uh, yeah. So when it comes to how to rat in wormhole space, we go through three general processes, and I'll share my top three ratters later, but for now, on the general processes. Now, these include identifying the challenge, designing a fit to do it, and then going and testing it out. Now we're going to use Ricky's guide to identify the challenge of C3 sites and then uh, Pypha to design and prototype a fit. And like a baby lamb, we're going to run out there and make some money somehow, somewhere. We'll see. Now while we go and rat, we'll uh, apply the basics of security that I mentioned earlier to increase our survival. So let's look at Ricky's guide and pull out one of the sites. Let's pull out the Fortification Frontier Stronghold. Now. We can see that the maximum DPS we're going to run into is 678, the max new pressure we're going to run into is 16 gigajoules, and there's not really much else we have to worry about. There's one preserver we're going to want to primary on wave 3, just because it remote reps. We hate remote reppers. And there's no scrams, so big key feature there. If the site is too hard, we can warp out, <laughs> so let's remember that. Now, on this channel, I've covered C3 Tangus, C3 Praxises, C3 Ishtars, C3 Gilas, a lot of C3 stuff. So I'll be leaving links in the description below to all those C3 fits, but for this video, I'm actually taking out a C5 Paladin. That's so that I can compare it against a C3 Paladin. And if you've been following along in the background, we've rolled a hole, scanned the new hole, bookmarked all the sites, and have so far ran two of the uh, combat relic sites, each paying off 92 million. So, so far, uh, Cherry and myself have each made 92 million while all this has been happening in the background. We are now finally off to our first actual site that we're gonna actually pull the time from. So we're starting at 0347 as our start time and we're landing on this outpost frontier. As a marauder, we can just go straight through the battleship and ignore the uh, sentry towers because we have the ability to tank plenty. So why waste time on something that doesn't give us a reward? And even as I say that, I did try to actually shoot one of the towers in between the waves. But nonetheless, we wanna make sure that we're using uh, Scorch as quickly as we can on the farthest uh, defender before they get into that awkward range where we're not really tracking them very well. If you're in a smaller class ship, you're just gonna be free firing any of these. They're all the same. 
And at this point, if you're a smaller ship and you depend on SIG tanking in any way, shape, or form, you're going to want to make sure that you spent all of wave two positioning yourself for wave three, because these little frigates will kill you <laughs> because they web you down and then the DPS from the battleships has become too much. So I recommend if you're an afterburning kind of SIG tanking cruiser, go sit by that rock that you see in space over to the right of the screen right now. But uh, yeah, that'll give you some distance to kill the frigates as they come to web you, and by the time the battleships get on top of you, you only have to deal with their webs and not the webs of the frigates on top of the battleships. Me as a paladin here, I just smart bomb the frigates and murder through the uh, battleships pretty quickly. And we're coming up on 03, probably going to end on 53. Let's see. And we're ending on 0353. Would you look at that? Next site. <laughs> okay, so we started warp at 0346 and we ended at 0353, giving us a site time of seven minutes. Not bad. That includes warp time since, uh, yep. I'll have to calculate or extrapolate what seven minutes is per hour gives us, but we will check that later. As we land on this solar cell here, sadly no bonus battleship, but we will do without. I'm going to go ahead and hell spawn the first wave by killing the frigate right away, and then I'm going to start bowling through these guys pretty quickly. Third wave is going to spawn just to our right, in line with the golden line, and we're going to primary the preserver because the preserver remote reps. We hate remote reps. He's also going to run from us, which means uh, if we don't primary him by the time we get to him, we probably won't be in our good comp flag range. Tank wise, if you're sig tanking, I do find that I'm still able to sig tank the preserver, even with the webs from the defender on this wave, so I don't believe it'll be an issue. I already went ahead and checked all the times and data. From when we left grid on the other site and started our time to when we finished this site was five minutes. So including warp, we ran a solar cell in five minutes. That's insane. Um, that's 516 million is an hour projected if you just had back to back solar cells to run. You know, that's a juicy situation there. <laughs> but that of course was also considering I didn't get a bonus battleship if we had a bonus battleship, we would have had 10 more mil. That would have been amazing. But we're gonna finish up this solar cell. I actually go and uh, check to see if the uh, gas site spawn didn't spawn. So from here, I begin the Oru's construct. So again, I start my times now when I start warp. I like to start them now because if you want to project, you know, hours, you're warping around. So including warp in your times, I think is extremely important. Now for uh, Oru's, here is the magic trick. You see those snake-like objects in the distance? We're going to warp to them. Now I forgot for a second and I'm like, oh wait, I'm not supposed to do this. Gotta warp. So right click the snake-like object you want to warp to and then warp at 100. After you do that, you'll get put on a very nice position to then be able to hit all the waves. Just like that, sweet. Nothing too uh, crazy about the Oru's, but some people do feel like they are a harder site of the C3 options. But they're really easy once you've learned the trick to walk closer and not waste your time approaching. Um, I ran this Oru's in five minutes, and again, including warp. That projects out to 534 million isk an hour if you just run back to back Oru's. So that's pretty good. Pretty good. Now, if you're at like I do, you then have to go back and pick up all your MTUs. So I'm gonna go back, get my four MTUs and get my grand total, which ended up being 222 million ISK. Remember, this is blue loop, so I take it out to K-Space and I sell it to MPC orders for exactly 222 million ISK. Got all that in 30 minutes, so not a bad run. Paladin definitely did what I expected, which was to blaze through the sights. It doubled some of my high scores on S per hour. <laughs> I will share those now for all my other C3 runners I have collected data for. 
So again, if you're curious about other uh, platforms such as the Tengu, please check the description for links. And now let's get into some relic data. A good old fashioned exploration money making. We have three data sites, three relic sites to run. Very can commonly be found in C3 space and we just so happen to find six of them in one system. Now as a ratter, I would have preferred if they were the sleeper data relic sites. That way I could have run them as if they are a combat site and made anywhere from 80 to 90 million isk off each one. But they're just the normal um, faction pirate ones. So we'll see what we can get off them. And as I hinted on earlier, we, we got something good. So normal can looks like this. A simple, normal, hackable object that's sometimes easy and sometimes hard. I find that I normally get about 4 million or less on my normal cans, but then every so often you get one that's like 10 million and then 15 and then I got twice is 50 plus, which is always a really good can. <laughs> but uh, most cans you hack will be not good, which is why it's recommended when you do go and hack cans is to run with a cargo scanner. I am a purist. I like the site to disappear when I'm done with it. So I like to run all the cans. So I don't personally run with a cargo scanner and that just frees up a slot for me. But uh, yeah, this is definitely the daily activity for a scanner in wormhole space, especially in C3 and other low class space where you can find these NPC uh, uh, faction kind of uh, data relic sites, the non sleeper ones. So I'm not really gonna go into how to do these because I already have made a video on that. And this is a more of a broad video, but I'm basically just looking for the core. Doing a little game of Sudoku. Not Sudoku, but <laughs> just follow all the numbers till you find the core and try to beat the obstacles while you're doing it. Skills definitely help. Definitely is nice to have the higher skills and the tech two module is definitely a game changer. The difference is night and day. So if you wanna get really good at these, it, it's worth your time to invest your skills and time. Let's see this Oof. oh that was a horrible combo that sucked I hurt <laughs> I think we're good though. Yeah, we're good. Sweet, sweet, sweet. 59 million esk. What? Enhanced awards 14. Okay. So there's the can, guys. You, this is the stuff you dream of when you run out and do uh, data relic sites. It's these mythical cans. They do exist. I got film one. I got one. Little did I know this site wasn't done giving because uh, sure, I ran into this one and yeah, this was a good can. This was a very good can. <laughs> Again? Another one? Oh, 73 mil. Wow. That's nice. Yeah, I think it was pretty nice. We made 246 mil at G to buy value, so pretty good. Now, together with the 222 million I made off the blue loot from ratting, I'm up to about 400 and 60 million isk that I pulled out from the C3 so far. So let's get into the last thing I have to share that commonly happens in C3 space, and that is huffing gas. All right, so I'm on my way to a gas site. And now that uh, I've already done all the other stuff in here, basically, I'm just gonna go relax, huff gas. At this point, I, I do online college, so I would go do it. <laughs> college class do some readings go 
go do something because uh, huffing gas is a pretty AFK activity, but uh, you do want to make sure you are still descanning and that you at least are aware. We still have ears up on holes, so I'm going to use that little safety network as uh, my way of safety reading. So I'm going to go up to the 32, approach that. We got 60,003 of gas here to huff. We can carry back, uh, what's to tell me? 9,000 at a time, small hunger. We'll be filling it up pretty quick. All right, so I'm here huffing gas. The third and final thing you can really do in C3 space after you run all the combat sites and do the relic data is uh, gas is a great way to start an industry empire. Uh, reacting the gas into uh, fullerene reactions is highly sought after and a good way to turn a 1 billion isk into 1.3 billion isk since you do make straight plus 30% percentages normally. Um, yeah, having gas. Be safe about it. Try to descan when you can. And uh, if we look at the map, uh, we have ears and eyes on this B1 over here. So if someone from the null sec wants to come over and in, which typically, by the way, null seckers don't typically jump into wormholes. FYI, um, but if they did, we would know about it. So we're safely just sitting here. That's what this Reaper is doing. He's out there uh, watching that wormhole. On the other side, I have my tune back over here, watching if anyone comes in from this chain behind us. And I'm just gonna sit here and huff gas. And again, um, I don't know if I said it, but this is when you just kind of AFK huff. Work on that fit you've been thinking about, you know, do some Eve stuff, check the markets, fix your Excel sheets. This isn't really exhilarating work, you just gotta make sure you're not getting ganked. And so, yeah, I'll uh, check in with you guys when I get a full hanger and we'll see how much I make. Um, full hanger should take like an hour or so. I don't know, we'll see. It's 5.05 right now. Alright, so as I'm uh, finishing up here, on getting a full load. Uh, Cherry actually went and salvaged. And from all the combat sites earlier, he got about 41 mil estimate in salvage, so that's also a way to make money. But on this little huffing spree, I think I started at 505, it's 538. And that's full enough. Let's go on home. We'll toss this into Eve Prazel. Get the current estimate. It looks like in Jita, it's going to get 27 million esk at buy value, 37 million esk at sell value. Oh yeah! That is huffing gas. That was 35 minutes of stuff. 30-ish million esk. Not bad. And this is the low tier gas. C32 isn't the worst, but it isn't the best. You got chilling with my gnomies. I got albino 